Blessings and peace be with us all. Let us join together in praise. Great is thy faithfulness. <clears throat> Please be seated. <clears throat> Let us listen for the Word of God as it's contained in the book of Psalms and reading in Psalm 8. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, 
the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established. What are human beings that you are mindful of them? Mortals that you care for them. Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, we give thanks. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> the concept of a Google Ngram may be familiar to some of you, but it was a new discovery for me when I recently came across it in an article. It's basically a search engine that charts word frequencies from a large corpus of books and thus allows for the examination of cultural change as it is reflected in books. The article I was reading was about awe. Awe, the sense or emotion so powerfully articulated by the psalmist in Psalm 8, which we've just heard. The Google Ngram charted how the word awe, although it's had something of a revival in the last 20 years, but it's still very much less used today than it was 200 years ago. As the article's authors observed, some pundits blamed technology for awe's decline. Rather than gazing at oceans or mountains, we pose in front of them for selfies. The thinking is that as industrialization has increased, society became more impressed with humanity's own powers and much less awed by creation's majesty. And yet, and yet technology itself can be a source of awe. Now, I'll frankly admit that during my year as moderator, I've had a bit of a love-hate relationship with IT or MS Teams or Zoom. Uh, the fourth on-screen meeting of a day could be a more than a little trying. But I would readily acknowledge that without the facilities of digital, digital technology in the last two years, worship would have been much more limited. Much essential business could not have been conducted. Families would have felt even further apart. And having seen behind the technical scenes here at the assembly hall, I marvel at what is being done to link us all up, both here and in people's homes. And we have cause to thank God for human ingenuity and the technical advances which bring us together this morning, and for the faithful service of people such as John Williams, Neil McLennan and their teams, whose technical skills make it possible. And whilst we celebrate new ways of communicating, surely we must not lose the sense of awe which God's creation can stir in us. The potential danger of the selfie on our mobile phone is that we may think that the world centers on us and we lose sight that we belong to something infinitely bigger. And so, if we can, let us look at the moon and the stars, at mountains and oceans, or let us bring to mind beasts of the field, birds of the air, fish of the sea, as well as a great diversity of humankind. And let us proclaim, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let us pray. As we gather together, wherever we are, let us give thanks and praise to God, our Creator. We look around us and are amazed at the greatness and majesty of all that God has made. 
Nature speaks of God's greatness. The vast expanse of the sky, mountains, trees, islands, lochs, streams. Words cannot adequately express the magnificence of all God has created. So we join in praise with the writer of the psalm, O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And may we show our love and reverence by caring for all creation. Let us also remember with thanksgiving God's abundance in fulfilling our many needs. Let us give thanks that during a time of pandemic and lockdown, we benefited from the skills of those who facilitated communication and the skills of scientists, doctors, nurses, researchers, which led to the development and deployment of vaccines and the caring skills of many which brought comfort to the sick and to the dying. And we pray that those who are suffering recent infection or have long-lasting effects of previous infection may feel restored through God's healing power. And as we meet today, our thoughts are never far from the plight of our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. In the darkness of invasion, above the deafening clamor of bombardment, we pray that they may know the light of hope and hear words which speak of love and peace, the gift of peace which Jesus promised, a peace rooted in justice and love and in the values of his kingdom. And now as we constitute this General Assembly, may we calm our whirring thoughts and seek the presence of the Spirit in the stillness. May the Spirit speak to our hearts in the words of Jesus and fill our lives with the Spirit of our living Lord. Let us commit ourselves for the tasks that lie before us and the decisions we shall be called upon to make. So may we be guided with wisdom that we may resolve those things that will promote the way of Christ and further the work entrusted to us in this church. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And let us now join together in the prayer which Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I call for the role of commissioners. Moderator, the role of commissioners is now laid on the table and has been circulated to commissioners. A year ago, I stood here, it has to be said, in a much less filled hall, and had the honour to become moderator of the General Assembly. It scarcely seems like 12 months, but during that time I've had the privilege of serving Jesus and the Church and being an ambassador for the General Assembly as moderator. It is now time to pass on the baton, and it is my privilege to submit for your approval the nomination of the Reverend Dr. Ian MacLeod Greenshields, Minister of the Gospel, as moderator of the General Assembly. Do you approve this nomination and accept Ian Greenshields to be your moderator?
Moderator, <clears throat> Ian. Blessings and peace as you answer the call to serve Christ and this church as moderator of our General Assembly. Ian, having attended previous opening sessions, I recall that at this point the outgoing moderator often has related tales from having known the new moderator at university or during <laughs> or early days in the ministry. And although you and I are both of the 1954 vintage, we did not meet until after you'd been nominated as moderator designate last autumn. But since then, I have come to know and to respect not only your deep faithful commitment to Christ and the church, but also your determination to ensure that in these challenging times, the Kirk is relevant and is seen to be relevant to the lives of many today who thirst for spiritual nourishment. You bring to this role your own experiences, the difficulties of childhood illness, the impact of life-threatening injury, which led you to ponder and search and to find faith through the rich revelation of the gospel story. You have had experience in, of ministry in both urban and rural parishes, a probationer in Broomhill, your first charge as a minister of Ward and Sacrament was in Cran Hill in Glasgow, and thereafter in Lark Hall, St. Machins, then to Snizot and Skye, where you moved as a family with Linda, and you had three children, Alistair, Ross, and Caitlin. And in 2005, you answered a call from the congregation in Dunfermline, St. Margaret's. And of course, your family has grown, you and Linda having adopted Ailey, Shona, and Susie. Through them and through your engagement in China, you have gained insight into the life of the Christian church there and what we might learn. You've been a prison chaplain and a hospital chaplain. As supported in life and work, you are one of the few, possibly the only person, to have been sent off by the referee in a prison Saints v. Sinners football match. <laughs> I know from others that your work as Presbytery Clark in Dunfermline was most valued and respected, and not least because the efforts you made to bring about the new Fife Presbytery, thereby in confirming a lesson which I learned in my political life, that whenever there is restructuring or reorganization, Fife will always emerge as Fife. <laughs> Ian, your ministry reveals a very real commitment to help those on the margins, be it through establishing community trusts in your first two charges, or through the Hope for China charity you established to make a difference for young girls in Guangxi province, and now through your work of getting alongside those whose lives are scarred by drug abuse and addiction. And you've said that mission must be at the core of what the church seeks to do in this age as we strive to advance Christ's kingdom. So we can be confident that, as the, leadership, that the leadership you will give to us over the coming year will ensure that priority of mission in our work. Ian, may I share with you two messages which gave me particular encouragement when I became moderator designate. Friends in Annan Old, where I grew up, sent me a message quoting the former moderator John Miller. The task ahead of us is never as great as the power behind us. And another previous moderator said that she had felt as if she'd been carried along on a carpet of prayer. Please be assured of our prayers today as you enter upon your duties in the year ahead. Let us pray. Eternal God of love, your church praises you for the majesty of creation and for the miracle of human life, but most of all for the gospel of life, death, and the triumph of Jesus Christ. From hand to hand, from generation to generation, the wonderful news of grace and hope is passed on to be declared afresh, and the joy of the church echoes on and on through the centuries. In this moment of our church's history, you have called your servant Ian to focus our prayers, to moderate our debates, to encourage our commitment, and in the months to come to represent this General Assembly. As we install him now to the task for which you have so generously equipped him, renew in him the gifts of grace and good humor, of wisdom and imagination, that he will need at the heart of the work and witness of the church. Bless those whose task will be to sustain him with their love. 
Linda and their children Alistair, Ross, Caitlin, Ailey, Siona and Susie, and give patience and joy to the congregation at St. Margaret's as they give their ministers time as an offering to our national church. Ian, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and always shall be. Amen. And now may I give you the symbols of your office. Please be seated. Right Reverend, your grace, commissioners of this General Assembly, and honored guests here with us. Can I thank Lord Wallace for his more than generous words here today and express to you that I am genuinely humbled, honored, and privileged to be appointed as moderator and to serve both you, this church, and our Lord Jesus Christ in this capacity. I'm very much looking forward to the coming days here in the assembly. It's amazing, it's marvelous that we are now able to gather together, both in person and online. I'm also along with Linda, my wife and my chaplains, positively anticipating the year that lies ahead, looking forward to engaging with the church and representing this our church. My prayer is that God will grant to me the wisdom for the fit for the task, as well as your support and your prayers, which have been so generously expressed to me and offered to me by so many people over the last number of weeks and months, and I deeply appreciate that support. Thank you. The purse bearer has conveyed to the principal clerk Her Majesty's commission to His Grace, the Lord High Commissioner. Is it the pleasure of the General Assembly that Her Majesty's commission to His Grace, the Lord High Commissioner, be now read? All stand. Elizabeth II, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom, of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of our other realms and territories, Queen, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith, to whom all these presents may concern. Greeting. Whereas we, taking into our royal consideration that the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland 
was appointed to meet on the 21st day of May, and seeing we, by reason of our other weighty affairs, cannot in person be present in the said assembly, and we being desirous that our right trusty and well-beloved counsellor, Patrick Stuart Hodge, Lord Hodge, shall discharge the great trust of our High Commissioner to the General Assembly. We ordain a commission to be made and passed in due form under the seal appointed by the Treaty of Union to be kept and made use of in place of the great seal of Scotland, nominating, constituting, and appointing like as we by these presents do nominate, constitute, and appoint the said Patrick Stuart Hodge, Lord Hodge, to be our High Commissioner to the said General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. Giving and granting unto the said Patrick Stuart Hodge, Lord Hodge, power, commission, and warrant to represent our sacred person and royal authority and supply his presence and hold his place in the said ensuing General Assembly as our High Commissioner, specially appointed for that effect, and to do all and everything belonging to the power and place of a High Commissioner to a General Assembly, as fully and freely in all respects as any other in that high station hath done or might have done in any time heretofore, and as we ourselves might do, if personally present. We hereby ratifying and approving all and whatsoever things the said Patrick Stuart Hodge, Lord Hodge, shall in the discharge of this commission lawfully do or cause to be done. We hereby and re require and command all the ministers, the diaconate and elders of the said assembly and church with all other of our good subjects in Scotland of whatsoever degree or quality to acknowledge, reverence, honour and obey the said Patrick Stuart Hodge, Lord Hodge, as our High Commissioner to the effect and manner above mentioned. And we declare that this commission shall commence and be in force from the 20th day of May and from thenceforward to continue during the session of the said General Assembly or until this commission be by us revoked and discharged. And we ordain the said commission to be further extended in the most ample and best form with all clauses needful and to pass the seal aforesaid per saltum without passing any other seal or register. These presents shall be a sufficient warrant to the keeper of the registers of Scotland for writing the said commission in the register of the great seal and to the keeper of the said seal for causing the same to be appended thereto. Given at our court at Buckingham Palace the 17th day of May 2022 in the 71st year of our reign by Her Majesty's command, Nicola Sturgeon, First Minister. Is it the pleasure of the General Assembly that Her Majesty's Commission to His Grace, the Lord High Commissioner, should be recorded? The purse bearer is conveyed to the Principal Clerk, Her, Most Majesty, Her Majesty's Most Gracious Letter. Is it the pleasure of the General Assembly that Her Majesty's Most Gracious Letter be now read with all due honour and respect? Right Reverend and well-beloved, we greet you well. We gladly renew on this occasion our pledge to preserve and uphold the rights and privileges of the Church of Scotland. In doing so, we acknowledge with gratitude to Almighty God, the Church's steadfast witness to the Christian faith and its services to our people in Scotland and in many lands overseas. 
We are aware that throughout the last year, the COVID-19 pandemic has continued to be a burden. It is good to hear how Scotland's churches and people of other faiths have been drawn together as they have faced the challenge of sustaining their own communities while continuing to care for their neighbours in need. We welcome to the strengthening of relationships between people of faith and those in local and national government. We know that the Church of Scotland engaged closely with debate engendered by the meeting of COP26 in Glasgow. And we are particularly conscious that the Church is seeking to play its part in reducing greenhouse gas emissions as a demonstration of your Christian concern for God's creation. We continue to pray for the leadership of the Church as they consider the future of parish life and make decisions regarding buildings and congregations. We ask for all those who carry these responsibilities, the gifts of wisdom and compassion, as they seek to respond to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, while bearing in mind the concerns of church members. The tragic loss of life and the scattering of refugees as a result of the war in Ukraine has caused much distress. It is encouraging to know that the Church of Scotland has been able to offer support through raising funds and providing a welcome to the stranger. We all hope that peace will be restored and we continue to uphold in prayer those who are putting into practice the love which is at the heart of the gospel. May your faith and courage be strengthened in your deliberations during the week ahead and through the times to come. As we are unable in our own person to be present at your assembly this year, we have chosen our right trusty and well-beloved councillor, the Right Honourable Lord Hodge, to be our representative, being assured that our choice will meet with your approval. And so praying the blessing of Almighty God may attend your deliberations, we bid you heartily farewell. Given at our court at Buckingham Palace the 17th day of May 2022, in the 71st year of our reign. Is it the pleasure of the General Assembly that Her Majesty's most gracious letter should be recorded? Would everybody please remain standing? It's our pleasure now to ask that the Lord High Commissioner address the General Assembly, and he will do so through Zoom. Right Reverend and Right Honourable, Her Majesty the Queen has commanded me to assure you of her great sense of your steady and firm zeal for her service and to assure you of her resolution to maintain Presbyterian church government in Scotland. Pray be seated. Right Reverend Moderator, it gives me great pleasure to offer you my warmest congratulations on your appointment as Moderator. I wish you a most happy and rewarding year in office. Appointment as moderator is the highest honour that your colleagues can bestow. I have no doubt that your prior work as a parish minister in Cranhill, Lark Hall, on the Isle of Skye and in the city of Dunfermline, your experience as a prison chaplain and a psychiatric chaplain and your work in presbyteries have given you the experience and insight to take on the role of leadership and to present the church's work both within this country and on the international stage. You undertake this important work with the loving support of your wife, Linda, and the prayers and good wishes of the whole church. May you and your wife find both happiness and satisfaction 
this year in this special work of public service. Moderator, I feel deeply the honor of being invited by Her Majesty the Queen to represent Her Majesty at this gathering in a year which marks two important anniversaries in our national life. I refer to the 200th anniversary of the visit of King George IV to Scotland, and more significantly, to Her Majesty's Platinum Jubilee, in which we celebrate Her Majesty's 70 years as our sovereign and her unequaled public service in that role. The first anniversary is significant because the visit of George IV in August 1822 was the first visit of a British monarch to Scotland for very many years. It was later celebrated by, among other things, the statue of the King that stands in George Street and by the striking portrait by Sir David Wilkie of the King in Highland attire, which is displayed in the dining room in Holyrood Palace. The visit was designed to heal the rift between the House of Hanover and Scotland. It was choreographed by Scotland's great romantic novelist, Sir Walter Scott, who invented traditions in Scottish clothing and created an image of the Highlander as the quintessential Scotsman. Disregarding historical accuracy, he announced, we are the clan and our king is the chief. I believe that the ceremony of the keys and the establishment of the archers as the monarch's bodyguard in Scotland also date from this visit. George IV had a reputation for soft heartedness and amiability, but he was in many ways not an ideal role model both before and after he acceded to the throne. The king nevertheless re-established the connection between the royal family and Scotland, which was cemented in the long reign of Queen Victoria between 1837 and 1901. That connection and affection for this country has continued to this day. Queen Victoria's reign was, until quite recently, the longest in British history. But Her Majesty the Queen has held the record for several years. The nation celebrates that unparalleled public service next month. I was born in the year of the Queen's coronation and remember as a small boy being very proud of a silver napkin ring which a kind uncle and aunt had given me at my baptism in June 1953. It had a special hallmark which represented the year of the coronation and I recall being fascinated by that. Her Majesty's presence as the head of state has been a constant throughout my life. The Queen's message of Christian hope which Her Majesty has delivered each year at Christmas has played an integral part in the celebration of Christmas over the years. The Queen has been an exemplar of the Christian ideal of service and each year has articulated the timeless values for which the church stands. It is a great pleasure for me to see you again in the assembly hall and shortly, I hope on Monday, to return to this building at, a, at the time of the General Assembly. I have happy memories of working as procurator to the General Assembly for several years following the millennium and providing legal advice when it was needed on the floor of the Assembly. Fortunately for me, it was not often needed. There were many in the Assembly Hall who knew practice and procedure far better than I. I also have happy memories of later serving as convener of a special commission of the General Assembly between 2009 and 2011, when I had the privilege of working with excellent colleagues in seeking resolution of an issue which then divided the church and has created divisions in other churches. On looking into this year's blue book, just as I used to do as procurator, and I suspect as my long serving and most able successor as procurator continues to do, 
I see that there are important and difficult issues for this assembly to debate and resolve. It is so good as the terrible pandemic loosens its grip on our lives to see the General Assembly start to return to its traditional form as a gathering in person of the commissioners where possible from all parts of Scotland to perform these important tasks. I note that among the issues which this assembly has to consider, there is the future structure of the church. This has been an issue which the church has grappled with for some time. It has been rendered more difficult by the pandemic. COVID closed our churches for many months. Inevitably, there has been reduced income from congregations and other sources. In Scotland, there is the continuing problem, which the legacy of our complex ecclesiastical history, uh, which is the legacy of our complex ecclesiastical history, of an excess of church buildings. Social change since the 1950s has created a multicultural society, both in Scotland and more widely in the United Kingdom, in which the voices of people of different faiths and those of no faith are heard alongside the articulation of the Christian tradition. The church faces the challenge of how best to have its voice heard and achieve its worthy aims when there are fewer people and less money available to take forward the church's mission. But challenges can be opportunities. May it not be possible for the church to achieve much with fewer resources if we focus on what we have in common both internally within the church and externally by cooperation with other denominations, other faith groups and secular organizations which are seeking to achieve in the community the social goals which the church has long espoused. I note also that this assembly has the task of trying to understand what the gospel requires of us in response to our developing understanding of the complexities of sexual orientation and same-sex relationships. On this occasion, it is a question of how to accommodate different views within the church in relation to the celebration of same-sex marriages. These are important matters which may give rise to robust and open debate. It's not the role of the Queen's representative uh, to interfere in any way with those debates. At the General Assembly in the year of Her Majesty's coronation, the moderator, Dr. Pitt Watson, informed the Lord High Commissioner that the ceremonial at the beginning and closing of the General Assembly was more than mere ceremonial. The General Assembly, he said, was the Supreme Court of a church that is national and free. And the presence of Her Majesty's representative was the expression of the unique and historic achievement of the relationship of church and state. I take to heart those observations. May I simply say this, at a time when political leaders in autocratic regimes and regrettably in some democracies have often been disrespectful of the truth and commentators accept with a resigned shrug the deliberate purveying of lies. The commitment of the church and other churches to promote truthfulness in our public and private lives has never been more important. The Old Testament prescription of acting justly, acting with compassion and acting with humility retains its relevance today. The church can go forward without fear, in forging the way ahead for the church in a much more diverse society than that which existed in 1953, we may bear in mind and take confidence from the comforting words of Jesus Christ in the Gospel of St. Matthew. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Right Reverend Moderator, in the name of Her Majesty, I now invite you to proceed with the business for which you are assembled, and the guidance and blessing of Almighty God be with you.
The General Assembly, please stand. Your Grace, Lord High Commissioner, we are genuinely sorry to hear of your ill health, and we do thank you for joining us in this way. It has shown us just the miracle of the ways in which we can still communicate despite adversity. We trust and pray that you will be restored soon to full health, as indeed we do for your good lady wife as well. We, the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, welcome you as our Lord High Commissioner. And we do thank you for your gracious, encouraging, and insightful words to us. As you spoke, we very clearly were listening to someone who understands the Church of Scotland, who understands the situation that we find ourselves in, the challenges that lie before us. And we are comforted in the knowledge that our Lord High Commissioner has such good insight into the life and the witness and the history of this church. Indeed, we are privileged to have someone of your caliber as Deputy President of the Supreme Court. You are one of the legal minds, the leading legal minds in the United Kingdom. But you're also very evidently a person of faith and a person who has a deep commitment to this church as member and elder. It is good that you are here with us and we look forward to you coming to the General Assembly when you are fit and well to do so. But it's good to know that you were here before in Edinburgh studying and you come back in a different capacity. We look forward to your company. We look forward to your wisdom. And we assure you both of our support and we assure you too of our prayers for you and for Lady Hodge at this assembly time. Your Grace, a very warm welcome to you. Would everybody please be seated? Lord Wallace, Jim, I am more than delighted to offer the sincere thanks of this church to you for the service that you have rendered to us over these last 12 months as moderator. And because I'm a few months older than you as your senior partner to do so. Jim, your appointment was both unique and it was imaginative, and it has proved a great success. You brought great experience from your political life, from your Christian life, from your Christian faith, from your commitment to the Church of Scotland and your understanding of the Church of Scotland as an elder. You've brought all of these things together to this office of moderator. There is no doubt in my mind, and I'm sure in the mind of every commissioner here today, that you have been a good ambassador for this church, and that you have been very ably supported by Lady Wallace, Rosie, your wife, very much a team working together creatively and well. You came to this task at a difficult time for both this country and the church, and you had to be very adaptable as well as having to face a great deal of uncertainty, especially around foreign travel. You spoke about having to go on a learning curve when you opened the General Assembly. You have done that well and adapted well. 
Nevertheless, this has been a busy year for the church, and we are in your debt for the many and diverse ways in which you have served the church and served this country, and when you have enriched the lives of so many people by your presence and by your wisdom, and can I also say by your humility as well. You have worked diligently with vigor right up to the very end until the very last week when you visited Hungary and the Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you for your service to this church, our church, your church. You have done so well, and we have been blessed to have you as our moderator. Thank you. I now invite the Right Honourable Lord Wallace of Tankinus to address the Assembly. Moderator, <clears throat> may I thank you so much for your very generous words, which are very much appreciated. I want to thank the General Assembly for the honour and privilege which you gave me a year ago, to serve Jesus Christ, our church, and the General Assembly as your moderator, to be an ambassador for the Church of Scotland, to have the opportunity to meet people from both church and community life in many erts and perts of Scotland, and occasionally beyond, it has been truly energizing. And I should like to express very real gratitude that throughout the last year, I have been sustained by the knowledge that I was being supported by the prayers of many people. I'm also appreciative of those during the year who have expressed or sent me messages of encouragement. Now, I've got to say, at this point, there's a possibility of letting further expressions of thanks make this sound more like an Oscar ceremony. <laughs> <coughs> of course, there's the ever-present danger that you'll miss someone out. So can I just confine myself to expressing special thanks to Rosie, for all, the, <clears throat> for all the loving support and encouragement which she has given me over the past 12 months, indeed over the last 39 years. I want to thank my chaplains, Fraser and Marjorie, for their support, guidance and sage advice, not least for guarding me against any theological blunders. And then thanking staff, some of whom I now have actually met in person. It would be invidious to name individuals except for the moderator's PA, the indefatigable Catherine McIntosh. And I know Rosie would want to join me in mentioning and thanking Nancy Lamont, who has been a real source of help for successive moderators in two Rothsey Terrace. And just as I would inevitably offend by omission in thanks, so too I shall refrain from embarking on a travel log, a sort of Cook's tour of Scotland, mentioning all the places we've visited, in case I miss out somewhere. Suffice to say that wherever we have gone, Rosie and I have been so very appreciative of the warmth of the welcome we have received. So let me reflect on some key events and recurring themes. Last year's General Assembly passed the Presbytery Mission Plan Act. I did think at the time that that was the easy bit. The difficult bit is its implementation across presbyteries. And I'm not going to disguise the fact that in many parts of the country, I found a kind of angst, disappointment, even disillusionment, which can so often accompany change and uncertainty. So this must surely be a time when those of us in leadership show awareness and show sensitivity. And colleagues exercise pastoral care for each other not least to those tasked with delivering messages which may be unpalatable to some. But can I say that I found it particularly troubling to be told that some places don't always feel loved by the centre. And I dare to say that there are those in the centre who do not always feel appreciated by those they try to serve and support. Maybe we all need to try, to ha try harder to love one another. And in the words which Paul addressed to the church in Thessalonica, to encourage one another and build each other up. 
And going forward, it's evident that there will be increasing demands on the eldership. Already, and in some cases for some time, elders have been stepping up to assist with worship and pastoral work. I have learned the first-class examples of training for elders, which hopefully can be accessed on an even wider basis. And as I visited congregations, and especially attended elders' gatherings in Irvine and Kilmarnock and Angus Presbytery, and a lively and stimulating conference energizing the eldership organized by Glasgow Presbytery, I have found elders, in the words of Peter in his first epistle, eager to serve. Both in presbytery visits and on other occasions, I have been so impressed by the valuable work of service to God and those in need by chaplains, and in a range of settings, in hospitals, prisons, universities, schools, in ports, at an airport, in diverse places of work. Many of them bore the brunt of ministering on the front line during COVID. And I was also privileged to see at close quarters the work of the armed forces chaplains when I spent two days with the Royal Navy. Chaplains getting alongside with those whom they serve, often in very challenging circumstances. During the coming week, the General Assembly will properly recognize the armed forces chaplains. But without in any way detracting from that, may I suggest that thought be given at future General Assemblies to recognize the service given by many others engaged in chaplaincy, others who are getting alongside those they serve in the name of Jesus. At one meeting, when chaplaincy was being discussed, someone asked me, what kind of pastoral chaplaincy support did you receive when you were an MP or an MSP? Frankly, the answer was nothing. But it did get me thinking. And I raised the question in return as to who ministers to the ministers. And in some places, I've been reassured that a good network of pastoral support does exist. But all too often, the response I received suggests that there are places where, that, where there is a need to be addressed. Encourage one another and build each other up. I've also been conscious that whilst the shorthand presbytery plan is sometimes used, the correct term, of course, is presbytery mission plan. And over the last year, I have witnessed countless examples of mission. I wonder sometimes whether members maybe be a bit put off by that term. It conjures up the sort of mission which, as a student, I engaged in with fellow students, knocking on doors in Immingham and Humberside. To many, that can sound a bit scary or daunting. But I was given a proper perspective on mission last week in Forfar, when being shown the congregation's pop-up school uniform shop. The person showing me round described how uniforms, including sweaters and shirts, were handed in and duly washed and ironed before being displayed for reuse. And she said to me, we have 90-year-old members who do the washing and do the ironing. It is their contribution to mission. And we need to reassure our members that mission isn't just for those and such as those, but it can include their contribution in a multitude of diverse ways. Mission calls us to respond to human need by loving service. Whatever the downsides of lockdown and pandemic, it did lead to what Pope Francis described as an eruption of humanity. Simple acts of kindness, a phone call to someone who was lonely or isolated, help or contribution to a food bank, delivering groceries to a neighbor. And our challenge now surely is to harness that eruption of humanity and not let it dissipate or slip through our fingers like sand as we return to what some would describe as normality. That's surely a missionary challenge for our church. And I particularly want to highlight the work of Crossreach in their response to human need through loving service. The different Crossreach services which I have been privileged to visit have displayed two constant features. The quality of the service provided and the commitment by staff to recognize and honor the dignity and personality of each person who receives Crossreach services, regardless of the circumstances 
in which they've been brought into contact. That commitment, I believe, reflects the leadership given from the very top. I readily confess that I had not fully appreciated, appreciated the extent and the quality of Crossreach's work before my engagement with them during the past year. And I suspect the same goes for many Kirk members. So let their light shine before others, so that others may see their good works and give glory to our Father in heaven. In the last 12 weeks, we've been both shocked and called to respond in love by events in Ukraine. Within hours of Russia's brutal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, individuals and congregations were calling to ask how they might help. How they might help both to welcome refugees arriving here in Scotland and to give aid to those fleeing from their homes in Ukraine. I think it's a reflection of the relationships built up with our partner churches in the area over many years that we were able to obtain prompt advice from them. And very soon an appeal was launched for funds to support the work of the Reformed Church in Transcarpathia and their diaconal work and the Reformed Church in Hungary in meeting the huge pressures of helping refugees who literally were arriving on their doorsteps. And I want to commend the remarkable response of individuals and congregations. To date, over £360,000 has been raised, and it has been very much appreciated by our partners. And earlier this week, I had the privilege of travelling to Hungary and Ukraine with Susan Brown and Ian Alexander to meet our brothers and sisters in these churches, both to express our solidarity with them and to see at first hand some of the remarkable work being undertaken. We also learned more about some of the refugee experiences. Among the activities we saw were a bakery, where one baker makes over, over so 750 loaves a day for distribution to refugees. We saw a church college where accommodation has been provided for those fleeing from conflict. We heard about the food bank established by our colleagues in St. Columba's Church of Scotland in Budapest to help them meet the needs of refugees arriving in the city. And in Transcarpathia, we saw projects such as after school and kindergarten provision for Roman, Roma children. These were established well before the war. It was loving service to those in need in their community and they are continuing despite all the increased pressures being faced. And we also learned that they want us to continue in prayer. Not only prayers in support of their humanitarian efforts, but especially prayers for peace. A peace that will be rooted in justice, reconciliation, and love. Addressing needs following on from the unprovoked Russian invasion of Ukraine links into one of the other marks of mission. To transform unjust structures of society, to challenge violence and pursue peace and reconciliation. Throughout the past year, I have joined with other church leaders in calling for action from both governments to address poverty, especially child poverty. And as a church, we must surely continue to make our voice heard, speaking up for the most vulnerable as the increasing cost of living inevitably impacts most on those in need. In recent months, at several points during the passage of the Nationality and Borders Bill, I made representations to MPs and peers to support amendments which improve the bill by bringing it in line with our international convention obligations, and which underlined our compassion and, our ca and care for our common humanity, including amendments to expand and protect family reunion li rights. And I readily spoke out against the government's proposal to transport asylum seekers to Rwanda. And I support the Archbishop of Canterbury for his robust comments on the issue. Now, I've had a political role in my past I do not buy in in any way to the argument that the church should stay clear of politics. In many situations, silence can be more deafening than speaking out. And what can be more political than a call to feed the hungry, to give water to the thirsty, to welcome the stranger, to care for the sick, to clothe the naked, and to visit those in prison? But what I believe is not acceptable is to claim that God is on the side of one political party or another. Abraham Lincoln is reported as saying that we should not invoke religion and the name of God by claiming God's blessing and endorsement 
for all our policies and practices, saying in effect that God is on our side. Rather, Lincoln said, we should pray and worry earnestly whether we are on God's side. And increasingly, the issue as to how we treat strangers and those seeking our help is to the fore. So let our prayer be that those in government, those making decisions will pray and worry earnestly whether what they are proposing is on God's side, on the side of Jesus, who as an infant had to flee to escape violence and oppression, on the side of Jesus, who says, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. And we also have a mission to strive to protect the integrity of creation. COP26 in Glasgow provided an opportunity to proclaim our commitment to nurture and protect a creation which God saw was good, and to seek climate justice for those countries and communities, almost invariably amongst the world's poorest, who have already experienced destructive severe weather events and need practical and financial support to build the infrastructure to protect them from future ones. Care for creation and loving and helping our global neighbours in need are faith issues. And if the March for Climate Justice in the middle Saturday of COP was the wettest I got during the last year, it was also uplifting to join so many from other denominations and across the interfaith community, making our voices heard. And the outcome of COP inevitably and predictably fell short of what we wanted and what is needed. Conferences involve negotiations, but the science on climate change is not negotiable. So the alliances we made in the run-up to COP must continue to hold, and we must continue to hold to account the world leaders for the promises which they did make, and to keep pressing for further necessary action if our children and grandchildren are to enjoy a sustainable future. And although there's no hierarchy amongst the marks of mission, the mission to proclaim the good news of the kingdom and to teach, baptize, and nurture new believers is obviously of crucial importance. In proclaiming the good news of the kingdom in our land of Scotland, I was encouraged during the year by the strength of fellowship and common purpose among members of the Scottish Church Leaders Forum. I was pleased to sign on the Assembly's behalf the St Andrew Declaration with the Scottish Episcopal Church. And I was humbled to play some part in taking forward the Declaration of Friendship with the Scottish Catholic Bishops' Conference, which the Assembly will be invited to endorse on Monday. Unity is not uniformity, but whenever we can love one another and be seen to love one another and to speak with one voice, then that surely must strengthen our witness to the message of the gospel in this land. And let us recall what my predecessor, Martin Fair, said when he stood here a year ago. The sooner we sort out the structures, the sooner we can get to what really matters, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Sorting the structures is not pain-free. We need to acknowledge the hurt and seek to heal. But during the year, I have not only been encouraged by witnessing many examples of congregations embracing mission, looking outwards into their communities. I also found inspiration in a book which was referenced by John Chalmers at a staff open forum meeting, Joining God, Remaking Church, Changing the World, which is a pretty ambitious title, by an American pastor called Alan J. Roxburgh. And although writing from a North American perspective, Roxburgh takes as his starting point what he describes as the unraveling of the Euro-tribal churches, a familiar story of declining numbers of aging congregations, strategy plans that just never quite succeed in reversing the trend. But far from being downbeat, he believes that the spirit is disrupting and calling our churches into a new imagination about what it means to follow the way of Jesus. The day after I became moderator was Pentecost. And recall that was the day when the disciples were all gathered in one place, when the spirit descended with wind and flame. But they didn't stay in one place waiting for people to come in. They went out, proclaiming the good news of the risen Jesus. And today, we must be ready to go out from our buildings and get alongside people, as Roxburgh puts it, in our towns and cities, in homes, around tables, in the fields at work, in the meeting places of everyday life of ordinary people. At all levels, and not least in our own upper echelons, we should be ready to take risks 
to do, for, to do what is right. We must be eager to discern the new imagination into which the Spirit is calling us and in our neighborhoods to proclaim the good news of God's kingdom, of justice and love. Thank you. can now rest from your labors. Well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you. The General Assembly will proceed to the appointment of a committee to prepare an answer to Her Majesty's gracious letter. Moderator, the names of those nominated will be found on page 18 of the Order of Proceedings. Is it the will of the General Assembly that those nominated be appointed? The General Assembly call for the report of the Standing Committee on Commissions. Moderator, all the commissions are in order. Standing orders will now be laid on the table. Moderator, the standing orders are laid on the table and have been circulated to commissioners. The General Assembly will proceed to the appointment of a procedure committee. Moderator, I move that the procedure committee be appointed in terms of standing order number, one, 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 number 15. Too many standing on <laughs> <laughs> The General Assembly will proceed to the appointment of a panel of tellers and a committee to prepare a minute of deceased ministers, missionaries and deacons. Moderator, the names of those nominated will be found on page 18 of the Order of Proceedings. Is it the will of the General Assembly that those nominated be appointed? Intimation will now be given of the arrangements for the celebration of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Moderator, arrangements have been made for the celebration of the sacrament here in the Assembly Hall and online via video conference on Monday the 23rd of May at 9.15. And in giving this intimation, I invite those who are joining us in Zoom and will join us in Zoom on Monday to be prepared with bread and wine in their home. The session is now suspended for 30 minutes. Please stand. <laughs>